Before this video begins, I would like to give a quick thank you to my Asbantium level patrons Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. So here we are yet again at the end of another series of Doctor Who. Series 8 is a series fans tend to have very different opinions of, so it's no surprise that the finale is the exact same way. Dark Water and Death in Heaven are two episodes people seem to feel very strongly about, for better or for worse. It's a climactic two-parter which sees the terrifying return of the Cybermen and the Master, along with high stakes and a lot of big cinematic moments. But is it actually good? Sure it's ambitious and it goes for scale in typical Moffat finale style, but does it deliver on everything it sets out to achieve? Well, as always, that's what I'm here to find out. So get ready, because this is going to be a big one. It's time to take a deep dive into Dark Water and Death in Heaven. Oh, a mission to this video is a big one, because these two episodes are absolutely huge and have a lot going on. It's not something that's easy to analyse and I had to do some good old reading to really get it right. And I was able to do this with the help of the app Readly, which is a really handy way to read magazines and newspapers from the comfort of your phone or tablet. In these videos I love to talk about the production of Doctor episodes, really getting into the weeds of it all and Readly helps a lot with this, allowing me to read magazines like SFX and Radio Times giving me great insights into Doctor Who behind the scenes, along with showing me a good idea of how episodes were received back when they actually came out. Readly is so easy to navigate with a world of magazines and newspapers at your very fingertips. Hell, you can even read newspapers from other countries, which is so cool. I particularly love the ability to download things and take them on the go, something really helpful if you need to go on a trip or you're away from your internet for a while and still want to read your favourite magazine. Readly's easy to navigate app gives you instant access to over 6,000 high quality magazines about all sorts of hobbies and interests. So if you want to check out this incredible app, you can click the link in my description for two months free access and you can cancel at any time. If you're a magazine lover like me, I'm sure you'll love it and I hope it inspires you in your day to day life just like it does for me in these videos. And now, on with the review. Can you just hurry up please or I'll hit you with my shoe. When it comes to a big two-parter like this, it's hard to know where to begin. There's so much to talk about and so many branching paths, so I guess it's easier just to start at the very beginning. Dark Water doesn't begin with some huge action sequence or thrilling set piece. Instead, it sets the tone for how much of a character-driven narrative this finale is. After Clara's many lies to Danny came crumbling down in the previous episode, she decides to finally tell him the truth, only for him to get hit by a car and die. Yeah, it's as blunt and sudden as it sounds, and it's absolutely brutal, a heart-wrenching and impactful opening as Clara finally tries to open up and be honest about her love for Danny, admitting she'll never say I love you to anyone else ever again, only for him to suddenly die in this very anticlimactic and almost random way. It's a genuine surprise, a central character being killed not by a Dalek or a giant intergalactic death ray, but instead by a regular car driver. I really like the way this suddenly grounds everything. Like Clara says, his death is boring. It's so casual and natural that she can't really comprehend it. It's not the fact he's dead that sends her over the edge, it's the fact it's so unlike the death she's become used to. Travelling with the Doctor has almost desensitised her to the normality of this kind of death, so she feels wronged in a way, like she's in denial of the real world around her. I've mentioned in a few reviews that Danny is Clara's tether to reality, so losing him in this way brings her back down to earth in the most brutal way possible. I love this as Clara's character motivation for the beginning of the story, a spark to really test her relationship with the Doctor and just in general send her off the rails. And off the rails, Clara goes indeed. She's overcome with grief until she remembers one important thing about her best friend. He has a time machine. This progression is even more shocking than Danny's death. Clara manipulating the Doctor himself to try and force him to save Danny for her. I think it's fitting how this scene takes place to this volcano backdrop, since it's the eruption of the tension between the pair, something which has been building up all series as they've disagreed and bickered with each other, seeing things in completely different lights. Do I have your attention? This is one of the best scenes Capaldi and Coleman ever share in the show, and it's such a great way to display how these characters have changed and developed over the course of series 8. Clara feels like she is 
owed better. A sense of selfishness stemming from the entitlement of her travels through space and time, becoming the hero and saving the universe. It's a lot like her version of the Time Lord Victorious, losing control and refusing to be bound by the laws of space and time because she believes she deserves better. So she resorts to throwing the TARDIS keys into a volcano to threaten her own best friend because she's just that far gone. It's a huge betrayal from Clara, a startling look at how far she would go to get away because she knows it can't actually be done. It's such a compelling sequence, dialing up all the drama to an unprecedented level. All the warmth and bubbly joy of Clara is gone, burned away by grief to the extent all that remains is her worst characteristics, because yeah, she has lost her tether to reality and humanity itself. I know it was all a dream is one of the most boring and overused tropes, but I think it actually works really well in this scene because there are still major consequences to the actions. The whole idea of the scene is that it lulls you into this false sense of high stakes and cataclysmic drama because Clara stole all the TARDIS keys and put the Doctor to sleep in order to get to the volcano and manipulate him. Having this all be a dream the Doctor tricked Clara into would usually feel pretty cheap, but it instead gives us that window into how this Doctor reacts to such a personal betrayal. It doesn't get angry at her even when she's destroying his TARDIS keys. He doesn't give her that satisfaction or vindication. Instead, he effortlessly takes control of the entire situation, giving Clara plenty of clear reasons why he couldn't help her even if he wanted to, because it would create a huge paradox. There's no point to the threats because there's literally nothing the Doctor can do, and I love how he refuses to back down, even though he does know it's all a dream. I feel like the 12th Doctor would still react this way even if it wasn't a dream, because he's not the kind of person to be manipulated, even if it is his platonic soul make Clara, and I love their following interaction in the TARDIS, the Doctor holding Clara accountable for a betrayal of him. You betrayed our friendship, you betrayed everything that I've ever stood for, you let me down! It's great to see this justified outburst, because he's genuinely hurt and feels used by his best friend, the person he trusts his life with, literally. It shows a lot about their friendship that the Doctor forgives Clara, something we don't expect from such a harsh and cold incarnation of the character. Do you think I care for you so little that betraying me would make a difference? It's a really touching and emotional moment of compassion, showing how strong this bond is, although it does also have the flip side of displaying how toxic their relationship can often be. Even after everything Clara did in the dream, the Doctor is still willing to go to whatever lengths he can to help her find Danny. Of course it's touching that he cares so much, but it does show how they bring out the worst in each other. The Doctor should never enable such behaviour nor encourage it, but Twelve and Clara are so close that his usual morals and ideals go out the window because he wants to make her happy. Happy. He'll be with her every step of the way, even if that means going to hell or the afterlife. This is it, Clara, one of those moments. What moments? The darkest day. The blackest hour. I love this pep talk from 12, hardening Clara's resolve and declaring it's a journey they have to share together, even though it will test everything they stand for and push them to their limits. He doesn't have to do this. He's under no obligation to help her find or save Danny, but he does it anyway because he's willing to push through all boundaries and responsibilities. And even though it's not intentional, this is all great foreshadowing for Hellbent, where he finds himself in the role of Clara in Dark Water, losing the most important person in his life and going off the rails determined to get her back, even if it tears apart the universe. So it's a great way to set that up even if Moffat wasn't planning for that, showing how that toxic behaviour is starting to trickle through and affect the Doctor too. And where is Danny Pink? Well, he's in a very modern, high concept afterlife. The Nether Sphere is absolutely fascinating as a setting and an idea. Such a polished and corporate Earth-like city filled with people like Seb, who is played by Chris Addison, aka Ollie from The Thick of It, which does make it a shame that the Doctor and Seb never actually cross paths. Then you can go and live happily ever after on the planet of the teddy bears. Well, there he walks, there he walks. Not only does the Nether Sphere look incredible, but it also comes across as very stylish and unique, with its skyscrapers covering the entire inside of this globe, which is such a brilliant visual. I love when media plays with different ideas of the afterlife. Most people immediately tend to think of religious afterlives, whether that be reincarnation, pearly gates, or burning wastelands, people's ideas of the afterlife have largely become the same. So it's nice when writers tend to instead focus on the general themes of the afterlife. For example, Preacher took the idea of hell being eternal damnation by forcing people in hell to constantly relive the worst moment in their lives. A horrific psychological torture which is far more interesting than them just living in a lake of fire. Stephen Moffat wanted to play with the idea of what happens after death, something Doctor Who hadn't really explored up until Series 8. He wanted to create a sense of existential dread only adults could really understand, and I think that comes through clearly in this finale. I think he does this all effortlessly as he suggests the traumatising idea of the soul 
soul still being tied to the body even after death. Meaning we're still conscious and feel what our own corpses are feeling. It's so nightmarish to think about, making the idea of cremation one of the most terrifying things ever. Since the dead feel their bodies being burned into ash, or they feel their organs being used for science. It's truly chilling and a surprisingly dark twist for Doctor Who. Once again showing Moffat's fascination with giving people of all ages horrible nightmares. With the idea that white noise is full of the voices of the dead, screaming and pleading three simple yet effective words. Don't cremate me. Don't cremate me. All throughout the series, we have seen people die and turn up in what is revealed to be the Nether Sphere. All these people transported into this strange new land, which is represented in two ways the Nether Sphere itself and 3W, the mysterious crypt filled with skeletal remains. Yes, I know it's so heavily telegraphed that these are Cybermen. It's all over the logo of 3W, which looks like the eyes of the monsters. And of course, it's a huge giveaway when Dr. Chang explains that the skeletons are in a special X ray water, which only shows biological matter. But it still makes for a really interesting mystery and chilling reveal at the end because throughout the episode you're so tied up with the other stories and events going on. I always love when the villains are in plain sight like the Cybermen and Missy are during Dark Water. They're right in front of you and it's plain to see, but Moffat's script uses a lot of excellent smoke and mirrors to distract you from how obvious it all is. With the benefit of hindsight, you can identify these skeletons as obvious Cybermen right from the beginning, but in the moment, you're busy thinking about Danny, the Doctor and Clara's relationship, and the mysterious Missy, a character we've been seeing over the course of the whole series. Now that was surprising. Yes, let's talk about Missy, who had been a slow burn mystery during Series 8, appearing from Deep Breath onwards, interacting with a lot of the recently dead characters and displaying a strangely detailed familiarity with the Doctor himself. Moffat wanted to revisit the series arc structure of Series 5 by seeding Missy into episodes, building up her mystery and this works really well because it keeps the viewers engaged and speculating the whole time. Even before the reveal of her true identity, Missy absolutely steals the show from her first interaction with the Doctor. I need to speak to whoever's in charge. I am in charge. It's interesting how we were almost robbed of Michelle Gomez as Missy, since she was originally intended to play Miss Del Fox in Time Heist until scheduling conflicts forced her to decline that role. Gomez fits Missy so much better, with her chaotic and unhinged charisma. Oh, Clara, 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 I should shoot you in a jealous rage now, wouldn't that be sexy? It's clear that the role was written specifically for Gomez and she absolutely knocks it out of the park throughout the two-parter, especially as Missy immediately takes the Doctor off guard by snogging him. This would usually be one of those awkward Moffat writing one-handed scenes, but I think it works really well for throwing the Doctor off and establishing the power dynamic of her always finding a way to catch him out and staying one step ahead of him. I love how she just swans into the picture, establishing herself as a mysterious yet funny character long before her nature as the Master is even revealed. Couldn't very well. I'll keep calling myself the master. Now could I? Indeed, in one of the best twists of the Stephen Moffat era, the enigmatic Keeper of the Nethersphere actually turns out to be none other than the Doctor's greatest frenemy, the Master, who had seemingly died in the end of time. But of course, the Master is never dead. Moffat had chosen to arrest the character during the 11th Doctor's era, but it makes sense to bring the Master back for the 12th Doctor, especially because this episode revitalises the character with the misdirection of Missy being a woman. It's important to remember that there was no real historical precedent for such a change at the time of the episode. The close the closest thing to it was the Doctor mentioning offhandedly that the Corsair had male and female incarnations, so this really was a huge change to the status quo and definitely paved the way for fans to be at least a little bit more accepting of the 13th Doctor when she came along. I think it was about time to shake up the Master a bit to completely revolutionise the character in this way, especially because Michelle Gomez chose not to familiarise herself with the Master's previous incarnations, meaning this character genuinely feels different and a breath of fresh air. Hell, the play on the 80s hit Mickey was actually an ad lib by Gomez, showing how perfect it is for her to play the character and add her own charismatic charm and flair to Missy. Hey, Missy, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind, hey, Missy. Hey. <laughs> Missy's sense of insanity was always there to begin with, even before Moffat decided to tailor the character for Gomez, but I love how he balanced this with the more comedic and deranged humour of the character. She doesn't go overboard like the John Sim master, and instead has a lot more interesting layers and a sense of depth, something I'll get back to later on. 
The initial reveal of Missy being another Time Lord is a great way to explain the Nether Sphere, since it's Gallifreyan technology she can use to upload the dead from throughout history and download them back into Cybermen. The Cybermen had always been Moffat's favourite monsters as a child, because, you know, he's based like that, but he had never really given himself a proper opportunity to write for them when he became showrunner, just using them in minor roles in important episodes and getting Neil Gaiman to write Nightmare and Silver. I think Moffat's enthusiasm for the monster shines through as he makes this episode more about the body horror and existential terror of the monsters than their more recent appearances had been. Obviously it's fun and thrilling to see the callbacks to Tomb of the Cybermen and the invasion as they leave their tombs and stomp down the steps outside St Paul's Cathedral, but the true value of the monsters in this episode is knowing they could be our own loved ones, adding this terrifying personal touch to them. You know the key strategic weakness of the human race? The dead outnumber the living. They're not just faceless villains who could be anyone. We know that these are real dead humans and you might come face to face with one of your own dead family members, resurrected into this sinister mechanical suit against their will. It's kind of a shame we don't get to spend more time dwelling on the idea of the people in the nether sphere deleting their emotions, a choice Danny is confronted with, only for it to not really matter anyway. We get that really heartbreaking scene as Clara gets a chance to talk to Danny, only to be too sceptical of whether he's even real. It's such a sad moment, because as a viewer we know he is real, but Clara has no way to be certain and Danny knows the reality of his death is too terrifying for even Clara, so he purposefully allows her to push him away. He doesn't want to let her join him, so he does this intentionally to protect her and that's a really depressing outcome for the pair, especially after the intro where it was shown how important those three words are for them both. And hey look, three words. That's kind of fitting, isn't it? But like I mentioned, it's a shame that they don't really give his emotion deleting decision the same weight and, well, emotion. Because he ends up a Cyberman anyway. And rather annoyingly, the Cybermen in general end up a bit of an afterthought in this story, pretty much relegated to being Missy's henchmen, which are freshly hatched and dumb, unless they need to take down a unit plane and then they can seemingly do just fine and coordinate stuff. Oh, and don't get me started on the whole cyber pollen idea. Something ridiculous even by Doctor Who standards. Apparently Cybermen can just explode into magic rain converting dead bodies into other Cybermen, somehow. It really doesn't make sense, which is frustrating, because everything else about this concept is so good. The clouds create this really dark, ominous and unnerving atmosphere over the world, especially in the graveyards where we see all these chilling visuals as metal hands punch through the surface of graves and bodies sit up on slabs in morgues banging against the doors. It creates such a fantastic sci-fi horror vibe and I love it, which is why it's such a shame that they pretty much waste this setup by making the Cybermen useless. Regardless, the combination of Missy and an army of Cybermen creates a tantalising ending for Dark Water, a sense of terror and high stakes shown perfectly by Peter Capaldi's acting. The Twelfth Doctor is scared in a way we've never really seen him before, just look at his desperate and frantic attempts to warn people to run away from the Cybermen, which is so unlike the stoic and analytical Doctor we've gotten used to in Series 8. Now he's just desperate to save whoever he can because he knows how dangerous this situation is, a threat even he doesn't know know if he can overcome. It's a very shocking reaction, driving home how deadly this combination of Missy and Cybermen really is. Even Unit struggles to make an impact, although that's mainly due to the writing just kind of wasting them. Sure it's a power move as Kate casually strolls in with a decapitated Cyberman head to drive home Unit's ability to fight the villains, but then they just don't. Unit basically does nothing in this story, they show up with nameless soldier goons and then they elect the Doctor as President of the Earth before just calling it a job done. Yeah, great job guys, pat yourself on the back for that one. Kate Stewart is also kind of wasted in the episode, the most she does is brag about playing bridge and then fall out of a plane. Oh actually wait no, she does their classic my father stuff. Funnily enough, the most important element of unit in this episode is Osgood, whose contribution is dying. Moffat wanted to emphasise the danger of Missy's character by having her kill off this established character, whose death was already planned as part of Series 9's Zygon 2 parter. It's a great shocking death scene, especially because Osgood is a fan favourite character, Death in Heaven even implying she might become a companion. Her being killed off so suddenly and absolutely really does a fantastic job at showing that deadliness of Missy, pulling no punch and allowing her to truly run rampant. You're gonna be as dead as a fish in a slab any second now, all floppy and making smells.
Back in Series 7, when the Doctor and Clara first met, the new companion mentioned getting his number from a woman in the shop. A mystery deepened in deep breath at the beginning of Series 8. Moffat had originally considered resolving this mystery in Name of the Doctor, which makes me wonder if she was actually going to be a Clara splinter. Instead though, Moffat decided that the mysterious phone number giving woman would be revealed as Missy, which we see in this finale as she gloats to the Doctor about handpicking Clara as a companion to make him weak and bring him down. It's a really brilliant twist and I love how it continues to push that storyline of the toxic relationship between Twelve and Clara. It's so interesting to me how Missy set this up, giving the Doctor this companion to exploit his weaknesses, with Clara bringing out the worst in him at times. The control freak and the man who should never be controlled, you'd go to hell if she asked. Missy has been constantly feeding this relationship and keeping them together because that's how she can capitalise and put the Doctor in a disadvantageous position. Many villains have mused upon the fact that the Doctor's companion is their weakness, but Missy knows the Doctor better than anyone else, so it makes a lot of sense that she go that extra step and literally engineer for him the best companion and worst friend in Clara. It reminds me a lot of the Scrap Series 1 storyline where it would have been revealed that the Ninth Doctor has manipulated the events of Rose's life to make her the perfect companion for him. We saw at the beginning of Dark Water just how destructive Twelve and Clara's relationship can be, so I think it's a great explanation that this was all Missy's doing. You put us together. I've kept you together. Another great character beat for Clara is her pretending to be the Doctor to delay the Cybermen and buy some time. It's a fantastic opening for Death in Heaven and it's such an interesting exploration of the wider story arc of Clara becoming like the Doctor, something very prevalent in Series 8 specifically with episodes like Kill the Moon and Flatline. These stories put Clara in the kinds of positions and ethical dilemmas the Doctor himself is always in, giving her all these tough choices to make. This opening takes all this growing independence and these Doctor-like traits and really takes them to their logical extremes. I absolutely adore the little touches in the opening credits, like Jenna Coleman's name coming first and her eyes taking the place of Capaldi's, really taking advantage of this misdirect of Clara actually being the Doctor. Ever since the 1996 TV movie, the actor playing the Doctor receives top billing in these credits, because they're the lead of the show, so to put Jenna Coleman's name there instead is really monumental and helps to emphasise how much Clara has changed and grown as a person, becoming just like the best friend she idolises so very much. See, I'm not Clara Oswald. Clara Oswald has never existed. Sure, she's lying to stay alive, but she genuinely makes a convincing Doctor because she has spent so long with him and aspires to be the same kind of reckless hero he is. But Clara also finds out the downsides of becoming a Doctor-like figure, because for all the people the Doctor saves, there's a lot more who die along the way. Clara is forced to confront this as Danny returns in Cyberman form, bringing her to the graveyard and begging her to turn on his emotional inhibitor, which I guess is off because he didn't delete his identity? I don't know, it's a weird aspect of the plot, and kind of runs contrary to what we've come to know about the Cybermen as villains. Ever since Rise of the Cybermen and Age of Steel, it's been established that the monsters are so evil Evil because they have their emotions completely shut off, which means they destroy themselves if those emotions are ever switched back on. But this somehow just doesn't apply to Danny. It's so contradictory, which is a huge shame because I love the idea of a Cyberman struggling with their true identity in this way, confronted with the truth of their existence, something we see in both Cyberwoman and the Doctor Falls. Death in Heaven tries to do something like this with Danny, but it just doesn't really come off very well and feels underexplored. It dangles this tantalising premise in front of us, the idea that Clara has to essentially put her own lover down, while at the same time putting herself at threat because he would kill her. It's the kind of horrific moral dilemma Series 8 had been focusing on so explicitly, but instead of embracing it, we just get this. Because love, it's not an emotion. Love is a promise. You like Huey Lewis in the news? Well, if it works for James Corden, I'm not surprised it works for Clara and Danny too. Despite Danny's emotions being switched off, there's still the magical power of love, I guess. This wouldn't be so bad if it hadn't already been done before so many times with Doctor Who and even the Cybermen specifically. It's such a boring cop-out ending and it feels like huge missed potential for this two-parter. Because he barely even changes after having the emotions turned off. So why have this aspect to begin with? Although I do like parts of Danny's role within the climax. The Doctor passes off control of the Cyberman army to Danny which then becomes a bit of a mirror to his first appearance in the show, where he was given orders to his school club. 
I like this because it kind of brings things full circle for Danny. He has this fantastic character arc in Series 8, and the finale shows this really well as it falls to him to save the day and protect Clara. It's really heartbreaking to watch as Clara is forced to say goodbye to Danny. Obviously, she's not perfect, but she genuinely loves him and has to suffer this bittersweet moment as he sacrifices himself. You can really understand her pain at having to let him go like this, especially with so much unsaid between them, since she never got to explain everything and give him the honesty he deserved. Danny's background as a soldier was mainly just part of Series 8 to give him and the Doctor a reason to be at each other's throats and bicker all the time, but I think Dark Water and Death in Heaven have the perfect payoff to this backstory, revealing that Danny accidentally killed a kid when he was a soldier. This is a very fitting way to explain his emotional reaction to the question of whether he's ever killed civilians, and it explains a lot about his character, especially his protectiveness as a teacher, since he desperately wants to atone for this horrific mistake by looking after other children and making sure they're safe and okay. We see him having to confront this guilt literally face to face by meeting the boy in the nether sphere and awkwardly trying to talk to him. I like how the story doesn't try to justify or trivialise this death, it gives it the proper weight and gravity it deserves, since it is a serious topic and a very grave mistake. This is the exact reason soldiers are trained not to blind fire, because of this very likely outcome. Danny's mistake and break of protocol cost a child his life and it's good writing to actually have him feel the guilt of that on a daily basis, blaming himself and therefore seeking to atone in any way he can. And this happens in a great way in this finale as Danny trades his own life for the child's, sending the kid back to Earth using Missy's bracelet instead of taking that chance for himself. It's a very heroic redemption for Danny, allowing him to complete this character arc and make things right. Throughout the series, the Doctor and Clara have displayed a very dismissive and closed-minded opinion on soldiers, but Danny's final brave act of self-sacrifice proves them wrong. It shows how important honour and duty really is to this character, a beautiful moment that actually has a lot of impact to it. But let's backtrack a little bit to Missy, who once again takes centre stage in this graveyard scene as we find out exactly why she's doing all this, which is to have the Doctor back as her best friend. I think it's a simple but effective character motivation because it highlights the pure insanity of the Master as a character, going to such extremes to have a friend. The writing in Gomez's acting really shows the deep and storied history between these two characters, a beautiful contrast between Missy's manic desperation to be noticed and the Doctor's weariness at having to constantly fight his former friend. I think Capaldi shows this kind of Doctor-Master relationship so much better than the 10th Doctor did with the Sim Master. A big part of their interactions was rooted in the Doctor's desire for them to reconcile and for the Master to become good, but it feels a lot more believable between Missy and Twelve. They're both immensely old and have deep, multi-layered characters. How may I assist you with your death? Well, there is uh, no immediate. I love the way this two-parter twists the usual reconciliation narrative by having it be Missy who wants the pair to reconcile, albeit on her terms. She just wants her friend back, even if that means threatening his friends, trying to invade his planet, and throwing him out of an exploding plane. You know, talk about clingy. There's an overwhelming obsessiveness streak within the Master, and Gomez is the perfect choice to bring that out, showing how far Missy would go to forcefully re-establish a connection with the Doctor. You'd almost sympathise with her if she wasn't so blind bloodthirsty and destructive. This script really allows you to understand that history and these complicated feelings, so it's a great deconstruction of their relationship. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Oh, shut up, Skylar. Indeed, according to Missy, it's the Doctor's birthday, apparently. Not sure how they measure that. It's such an unexpected twist when she hands the entire army of Cybermen over to the Doctor as some sort of horrific birthday present. It's a poignant way to cap off all the themes of the series. Series 8 muses on what it takes to be a good man, along with exploring the Doctor's hypocritical and unfair hatred of soldiers. He spends the series searching for his own sense of identity and going on this introspective journey wondering whether he's a good man or not. As goofy as the whole president of Earth thing is, is a great way to show how the Doctor is becoming the kind of person he usually hates, a military figure ordering others around. Danny even refers to him as a blood-soaked general to drive the point home. It's excellent how Missy capitalises on all this doubt about the Doctor's character by trying to weaponise his desperation to do good. She gifts him this army he could use to save entire civilizations, wipe out the Daleks for good, and create peace across the universe. But that's not the Doctor's way, it never has been. Well, except for that one time in Series 6, I guess. 
Legends. Robot Sherwood teased the idea of the Doctor not being the old-fashioned hero Legends would have you believe, and I love how Death in Heaven continues to push this potential idea of a morally dubious Doctor taking the kinds of dangerous risks no others have taken, throwing other people's lives away for experiments and stuff. It created a great lingering question as to who this incarnation is, and I appreciate that Moffat left it until the finale to actually answer it. I am an idiot. The Doctor finally realises who he is, who he has always been. He doesn't have to be good, he doesn't have to be bad, he just needs to be an idiot helping out where he can. He's not a good guy, he's not a bad guy, he's just THE guy. Acknowledge me! That's why he doesn't need an army, no matter what they can offer him, because he isn't like Missy, no matter how hard she tries to make him become like her. It's a beautiful conclusion to the story arc, giving the Doctor that sense of identity and self-belief, allowing for him to save the day as the unconventional hero he is. Although it's a shame the moment is ruined by the Brigadier coming back as a Cyberman, which seems just a little bit disrespectful. But then again, enough people have already talked about that, I can't really add anything new to the discussion. Death in Heaven concludes in a really fitting way, especially because Stephen Moffat was aware that Jenna Coleman's contract was up at the end of Series 8, and she hadn't yet decided whether to stay or not. So for a while, this was Clara Oswald's final Doctor Who story. This is obvious from the touching yet heartbreaking final scene between her and the Doctor, as they lie to each other about their happy endings. Clara pretends Danny came back, and the Doctor lies about finding Gallifrey where Missy claimed it was, despite it just being empty space. I absolutely adore the scene, as the Doctor just just unleashes his fury and anger on his own TARDIS console, a moment made so impactful by its complete lack of music, the emotion just speaking for itself. The Doctor had been so determined to find his home planet after he saved it in Day of the Doctor, so it's a cruel twist of the knife by Missy to tell this lie and get one over on the Doctor even after she seemingly died. It reminds me a bit of Last of the Time Lords, where the Master still won by denying the Doctor what he wanted, and that was for the Master to regenerate. It's an excellent scene which really shows the hidden emotional trauma this incarnation feels, an outburst so unexpected from a character who really keeps his cards close to his chest and doesn't show much emotion. That's how much this portrayal has affected him. This epilogue scene is a masterstroke by Moffa, these two platonic soulmates trying to protect each other by lying and putting up a facade, because it makes it easier for them to walk away. They need these justifications, believing the other no longer needs them around. It's a really unique and bittersweet ending for a Doctor and Companion pairing, and I still think it works even though Clara does then come back. You can almost look at it as it being the moment they should have got out of their toxic relationship, because everything that followed led them down a much darker path. Never trust a hug. It's just a way to hide your face. Dark Water and Death in Heaven as a two-parter is a very mixed bag, but then that's to be expected with pretty much all Doc 2 finales. It has some absolutely blistering high-concept storytelling, exploring death and the afterlife, along with introducing a fascinating new incarnation of the Master, who, you know, is perfectly brought to life by Michelle Gomez, and the episode touches upon some fantastic ideas for the Cybermen as villains, but it also falls very short in a lot of areas. The Cybermen and unit are pretty much wasted, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, because because they're accessories to a character story. It's mainly about the relationships between the Doctor and Clara, Clara and Danny, and the Doctor and Missy. That's the true core of the story, it's about the people and their complicated feelings and relationships with each other. It's all about the themes like guilt, betrayal, introspection, and so many others I could go on forever. Ironically for a Cyberman story, it's a two-parter all about the emotions rather than the cold logic and structure. Sure it has big action set pieces and moments of spectacle, but as the climax shows, it's about the characters, so I can give it a pass for a lot of its flaws. Therefore, I would give this finale a B ranking on the Series 8 tier list. It has so much going for it, including the absolutely incredible departure of Clara as a companion, but it is hard to deny some of the more glaring flaws like Cyber Pollen, Danny's emotional inhibitor, and those other little nagging issues that really add up to bring the score down. But a B rank is still really good, especially in one of the best series of all time. And this finale definitely sticks the landing, managing to juggle and pay off all these vastly different story arcs in very suitable and satisfying ways. So yeah, despite a fair amount of people hating it, Dark Water and Death in Heaven is a pretty damn good two-parter with staggering performances all round, especially Jenna Coleman, Peter Capaldi and Michelle Gomez. It's no masterpiece, but it does its job very, very well. Now if you'll excuse me, my throat is very sore and I'm ill after Star Wars Celebration. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna go get some much needed rest. See you next time. Cut out the whining while you're at it. 
And an extra special thank you to my Bantam level patrons, Fallon Cortez and Nathan Gibson, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman and Nick's Games, and all my Gold level patrons, Boots, Calvin, Daniel Shiletto, Francois Nakane Line Vortex, Herner Verzog, and Thomas R. Thank you so much for your support. 